Hey team, welcome to Inside the Movie Photographer with Jason Boland. Today, I have New York still photographer Barry Wetcher with me. Now, Barry is uh, somewhat of a mentor to me. He's uh, not that much older, but um, when I'm struggling with the moral turpitude, I always go to Barry to uh, check out which direction I should go. So this is a big deal for me to have him on today and for you guys to meet him and some of the photography that he's done is just insane. A couple of the films, Reckless, After Hours, Nine and a Half Weeks, Crocodile Dundee, which we both share a credit on on uh, Crocodile Dundee. Different films, but uh, same franchise. Goodfellas, Die Hard with a Vengeance, The Thomas Crown Affair, Mickey Blue Eyes, Made in Manhattan, Hitch, Lord of War, The Devil Wears Prada, Enchanted, I Am Legend, Marley and Me, The Lovely Bones, Now You See Me, The Drop, Annie, Creed and Creed 2, The Girl on a Train, and Ocean's 8. Now, Barry started his photography messing around with a wide lux camera, which uh, the it's the original uh, Pano. Um, he was exhibiting everywhere, and uh, then he got a job as a publishing house and finally got into the film industry through a buddy of his who was a first assistant director. So, Barry, I'm going to bring him in. and. Uh, Welcome. Hey, buddy. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Hanging in there. Hanging in. Yeah. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, man. It's such a privilege. It's, uh, I don't know if you heard the my intro, but yeah, you're my conscience. Did you know that? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. You you let me know that in the SMP, uh, SMP, SP uh, emails. Yes. Well, you know, I mean. Uh, you had to keep you honest, man. Well, you got to keep me honest. It's like I go off on tangents and, and um, I think uh, this is why we have such a good friendship and I do appreciate everything that you do. You are a level head and I know from your photography uh, that that comes through a great deal. And um, so why Lux, hey? So you, you just yeah. started to pick that up. Yeah, I, uh, I, why Lux is great. It's uh, for the people who don't know what it is, it's a panoramic camera. There were two versions, a 35 millimeter and a 120 film uh, version. I had the 35 millimeter version and, and um, it basically has a lens that rotates and it's 140 degree angle. It's almost, almost a complete straight line. And um, you would get a, a frame and a half on a 35 millimeter negative. And uh, I would do a lot of um, things on the subway with it. It's a limiting, it's technically a limiting camera. It only has three shutter speeds. And I would shoot a lot at a 15th of a second. So the lens would rotate really slowly around and I would move it with motion and against motion. And, you know, the fascinating thing was I never knew what I was going to get. Sometimes I got crap and sometimes I got some really cool stuff. So yeah, that's, I really love that camera. Oh man, we're doing, um, I'm doing this thing called five photo folio where I get like five photographers in and, and everyone throws in five, five, images of anything right. that'd be really cool to have you on um yeah. and you can show a couple of them because today we're looking primarily at um some of your unit photography which is just beautiful and it's um and historic man when, when what year did you start in the industry um I, I think it was 1980 is when i when i first started so it's uh, just about 40 years that i've been doing this um, yeah yeah, I think it was 1980. So I started out, as you said, I had a friend who uh, I, I really knew nothing about stills. I come out of another world in photography. Um, I had had a grant doing my White Lux work and when that ran out, I needed a job. And my friend um, offered me this opportunity just to shoot behind the scenes stuff of some reshoots on a horror movie. And I really enjoyed it. Um, and then I didn't really know how, I didn't know anybody in the industry other than him. Um, didn't really know how to get a job. Uh, and I kept looking at these trade magazines, newspapers backstage, and there was an ad for a film crew. And I sent in a, a resume, which really was just one film. <laughs> and they called me and I, I went to this like ratty office on uh, Broadway off 14th Street. And it, turn, it turned out to be, it's an interesting story, it turned out to be New Line Cinema. Oh, no way. Yeah, which at the time had only produced John Waters movies. I don't know if you're familiar with John Waters, Pink Flamingos, all these really crazy yeah. 
you know, avant-garde movies. And they were going to do a horror movie called Alone in the Dark um, with some legitimate actors, Jack Palance, Martin Landau, and they hired me. So that was my first real movie. And um, actually the first day on set, Jack Palance stopped and said, where's your blimp? And I was like, what the fuck is a blimp? <laughs> and, you know, there was no internet, so there was really no way to kind of research this. But I did. I figured out what it was. I called up Jacobson, and they sent me a blimp, and I had to figure out how to, how to do that. Um, and that was my entree in, into the film business, was that really that movie. Yeah. Wow. My, um, my first big film was with New Line 2, actually. They were a subsidiary of Warner Brothers back in the day, weren't they? Yes, they. I think they merged with Warner Brothers. They, they still have a division. Warner Brothers still has a division called New Line Cinema. What was interesting is that I would say 30 years, the guy that uh, ran New Line was a guy named Bob Shea. And about 30 years later, I went to a premiere of uh, Sopranos, Sopranos uh, TV episode. It was at Radio City, and they had a big banquet um, at the Hilton in New York. And I was at the buffet, you know, getting food, and there was Bob Shea. I hadn't seen him in 30 years. And he had, I don't know if he really recognized me, but we had a nice chat. So it's kind of funny. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah, because you've, you, being in New York, um, my entire you get, life. Yeah, and you get to shoot a lot of television there as well, not just features, right? So you've done some pretty good. Um, for me, I haven't really done much TV. I did uh, Sopranos, was. Uh, really the only epi real episodic show that I did. Um, early on in my career, there was very little TV, but I did do, in those days, we had movies of the week. So right. I, I, did, uh, I did, in 1985, I did a movie, a TV movie called Death of the Salesman, a famous Arthur Miller play. And that was with Dustin Hoffman, um, Charles Durning, John Malkovich, and a, a German director named Volker Schlondorf directed that. But, uh, I, I haven't really done much TV other than Sopranos. Sopranos I did, I did one season, and then I did uh, half of another season. So and what was interesting is I got a call out of the blue from HBO um, asking me if I wanted to work on the Sopranos, and I didn't have HBO, so I didn't really know what the Sopranos <laughs> was. And they explained to me it's a mob thing. That I, they they found me because I did the stills on uh, Goodfellas. So oh. ironically, ironically, I guess they thought, well, this guy's good at mob movies, so let's hire him. It's kind of kind of weird, you know, because it doesn't really work that way, as you know. But, no, but I know, but the industry does box holes all. No, it really it's does. really I, quite funny. It's like, it's like, you know, I could go and do memoirs of Geisha, but I yeah. always get action films. Right. I, you know, in the days where they used to hire specials, I can't remember the guy's name, but I, I, they were doing a war movie. I didn't work on it. And they hired a photojournalist that used to shoot, you know, do wars. Well, you <laughs> and I know that has nothing to do with working on a movie, right? No. A war movie. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't translate. So it's one That's of the pretty ironic funny. things about the business. You know, people don't, don't get that. No, and and a lot of the time it's probably um, you know inexperienced people uh, on smaller productions that think, oh, this will be rad. We can do this, and and um, I, I did a war film just recently um, called Danger Close, Australian one, which is about the Battle of Long Tan, which is insane. It was such a good film and great director um, Chris Stenders, who did you, the the film that you may have heard of his is um, Red Dog, which is um, really beautiful Australian film. But uh, we had Tim Page, and as you remember from the Vietnam days, and um, Tim came out, he was meant to come out for a day, and, and I was like, oh, these things never work. And um, we got on so well, and we had so much fun that he just came back every day for nearly two weeks so that we could just hang out. <laughs> and, it's like, and so it was, it, it was really cool because I was channeling my inner Tim Page anyway during that. So, but anyway, that's another story. Hey, um, we should have a look at some photos, eh? What do you think? Sure. Go ahead, go for it. Now, Halle Berry, oh my gosh, she... Sweetheart, Sweetheart. She's isn't she? Uh, uh, and look at that structure in the face. She's a, she can act, she's just, tell us about it. 
This is actually from a film uh, called Perfect Perfect Stranger. It was her and Bruce Willis. Oh, an odd an odd uh, an odd combo there. Um, and the reason that I that I actually uh, submitted this photo was I wanted to talk about headroom. Yeah. Um, for me, my personal aesthetic is I don't really like headroom, especially on a close up. So. I gave her a little bit of a haircut there. It's not much. Usually I give them more of a haircut. And um, it reminds me of a story. I was working on a movie. I'm not going to say who the photo editor was, but uh, the photo editor kept saying, you're, you, you know, you're, you're cropping, you're giving them a haircut. And I'm like, well, that's my personal aesthetic. I like that. Um, I don't like a lot of headroom. So I, I asked the uh, DIT, the digital imaging technician, to give me a few grabs. And I emailed them to her and said, this is how the movie's being filmed. And close-ups were filmed with, with, with head where they were given a haircut. I, I, I personally don't like a lot, a lot of headroom. So um, as you can see in this photo, it's pretty tight. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a, I don't remember what lens this was. It was probably a 105 or a 135. In those days, I was shooting Nikon. Those were the, this, oh yeah, this was still, this was digital. Uh, was it digital? I can't even remember. Yeah, I think this was digital. It was Nikon's. So it was probably, this is probably a 135.2 or a, or a 105.18. Yeah, it's beautiful, the, um, the bokeh in the background. Um, I was going to ask you what lens it was, actually. But the, it, the, uh, the light in the background does look big. So you, you're um, probably 135. What did you say? 105 or 135? It was either, well, in those days, you know, I liked the 105 and I liked the 130, the 135.2 and the 105.18 lenses I used a lot. And, uh, and these days, I very rarely used a zoom lens. So I also used the 85.14 a lot, but I think this was either a 105 or a 135. Yeah, I still have those two lenses, the 105 and the 135 f2. Beautiful lenses. Yeah, I don't great. use them anywhere near as much as what I like to, but. Right. Um, but yeah, that's a oh, beautiful, beautiful image. So this is the uh, Sopranos, and again, you can see I I I, uh, I don't like a lot of headroom. A little bit yep. there, um, and I have to say that um, Sopranos was a godsend when it came because it was right after 9/11. There was no work, so when oh. they told me, I was you know really happy to have work because there really was nothing in New York. Um, it was a really great experience. It was a great crew, and Jimmy Jimmy was a great guy. I got kind of close with him, and then, in fact, ended up doing two uh, two other feature films with him. And just recently, the last one of the last movies I did is uh, called The Many Saints of Newark, which it's not out yet. Obviously, it's a Warner Brothers film, and it's a prequel to The Sopranos. And um, Jimmy's son, Michael Gandolfini, plays him plays Jimmy at the age of 15, so it's pretty interesting. Oh, I must have a look at that. New York makes some great films and television. That's uh, my, I, I was saying to you earlier, my sister lives in Williamsburg, and right. you know we get over there uh, every now and again, and um, I just love it. There's a, just a thing about it that it's, you know, it's very European to me, but also American, which is what I, you know, two things that I like. Right. The thing, the thing about New York shooting in New York is we don't get a lot of uh, we don't do a lot of action movies like you know you do a lot of action movies we don't really get that many um, when I worked on Die Hard for me that was the biggest action movie that I had ever worked on before and after um, you know we get a lot of really kind of gritty movies we don't get these gorgeous you know gorgeous uh, Location, location type movies, and we don't do a lot of period pieces either. So most of the movies that I worked on are pretty gritty. Yeah, and you know, I mean, you shoot in New York because New York's the location, right? That's so true. That this is a great shot. This, that's a tricky shot to pull off yeah. on a film set. For those that don't know, that is not an easy image to get. No, that is uh, that is on a moving train, and I'm actually. Uh, they had two cameras. I'm actually underneath. I don't know. I don't remember. It was A or B camera. I'm actually underneath it, and I just kept wailing away because you got eight women all have kill rights, and you know that's going to be tough. 
So, and actually there's a poll that uh, in post-production we were removed, which is down the center. And that was removed. Oh. Yeah, that was removed. So um, yeah, that was a tough shot, not. really tough, especially as a moving train. And I don't know how many frames I shot, but um, I shot a lot. It's a stellar shot. It's like, it, it, I just, it's like tennis match going back and forward, looking looking down the line of um, of what there is there. And then, you know, the flexions, posters, what's on there. It's, uh, I love it. Yeah, that was a, that was a tough one. And that was, uh, I, the reason I submitted this also is just to say that, now that's Rihanna, obviously. So when I do a movie, I request that I'm at the uh, hair and makeup test. I find that at the hair and makeup test, not only are you meeting the actors before before you're on set where everybody's a lot more relaxed, um, it's a good place to do gallery stuff. You know? and, and this is what I did at, at the uh, hair and makeup test. And all these singles were used on the one sheet. And if I had not requested to be there, that wouldn't have been the case. Now, that's a very good point um, because most people don't, realize that our images for one sheets and billboards can come from anything and that's uh that's another i actually do the same sort of thing i, I like to go to um wardrobe and makeup tests and i've had so many posters from those right that you can never discount them you know and exactly what you said everyone's relaxed and they're more inclined to give you a an eyeline into camera or just off or whatever and and it's a it's a, actually a really special time of bonding for everyone and and yes. as we're seeing here you get results like this and and it, i mean as photographers we've got to be on the lookout constantly for the image sure. um and it's for us it's not necessarily for anyone else it's for us yeah. to go yeah i've got that that's right uh, that's very true you and i know that that when you when you hit that shutter when you got the shot, I mean, you know it. You just know it, you know. You just know it. And the advantage to digital as opposed to film is now you now you really know it. <laughs> you're not waiting, you know. You're not waiting for the slides to be uh, processed or for the contact sheets to come back. So, um, but yeah, uh, hair and makeup tests for me, uh, especially on movies, uh, I feel very important. Sometimes a line producer will fight me on it, you know. I'll, um, I'll ask the publicist or I'll ask the studio uh, photo people to, uh, you know, sort of ask that I be there. Just, yeah. But some line producers will fight you on that. Yeah, no, it's, um, I, I, yeah, I 100% agree. It's, it's any opportunity that we get to um, get these great images, it's, it's, uh, we've got to take them because once the film starts, starts rolling, it's right. not, uh, easy street and you know I think that's why us as photographers um, there's longevity in still photography and I think that comes down to experience and you know you can't beat experience in in many ways well, this is, is that uh, will oh yeah yeah that's will will's the best well have you worked with will yeah I worked with him not as a actor but as a producer on karate kid with Jaden when he was in that and what a, I love that family Right. They're like, that's so solid. And I remember one day, was my kid was coming to work every day. And, uh, well, not every day, but he was coming to coming to work a lot. And it was encouraged. You know, he'd go and hang out with um, with Jaden. And I said to Will one day, it's like, oh, man, you know, thank you so much for letting my little family visit every now and again. He goes, man, you kidding me? I bring my family to work every day. It's like, yeah, but kid's in it. <laughs> yeah, he's, so, he's a great guy. I've done three movies with him. He's... he's He's a, a, a an amazing human being, you know, and, um, amazing. He, um, when, this is the first, that's actually the, no, this is the second movie that I worked with. The first time movie, first time I worked with him was on a film called Hitch. But um, when you're out in the streets of New York and you're a celebrity or a well-known actor, you know, people are screaming and whatever. And he, he would just go over to crowds and, you know, take photographs with them and pick up babies, give autographs. As a matter of fact, in another movie, we were shooting uh, outside a park in Brooklyn and a school bus stopped and all the kids saw him, they were screaming and he made the bus driver 
opened the bus and he got into the school bus. No way. I swear, man, that's who he is. He's an amazing human being. He really is. That is, and he's got quite a wardrobe too. <laughs> yes, he does. Anyway, hey, this, um, so in this, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. man. No, I was just going to say, is that Andrew Lesney? Yes, I was just going to say that. Yes, rest in peace, Andrew. Uh, yeah. That is Andrew. He, uh, a wonder, I call him the mad scientist. Yep. Um, he did Lovely Bones too, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, right. In fact, he, the reason that I got Lovely Bones is he uh, he told Peter Jackson to hire me. That's how I got Lovely Bones. Oh, yeah, well, that's him. Oh, I love, this shot is so cool. It's just like... You know, and then you've got the little kid left poking his head into the frame. There's so much going on. And as you know, I, I love a BTS. And yeah. I actually love a BTS like this with, you know, a little bit longer lens too. That's not just super 24 mil or something like that, something that punches in. Right. Yeah, this is, this is on the steps of uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. We actually filmed a little bit inside of there, and nobody had ever filmed inside St. Patrick's Cathedral. They and they allowed us to do that. Unfortunately, it was cut out of the movie. But, um, oh, oh wow! I keep looking up because I've got a big screen behind me, so I get to look at the your photos in all its glory. Because I I try not to have I try to just flick through the images before we have a chat, right? Um, so that I can uh, be. Oh, now that is a great great shot. Thank you. Yeah, again, this is I Am Legend. This is on the overpass um, a Grand Central Station. So the thing about I Am Legend for people who never saw it was the challenge for, for me and the filmmakers was, you know, in a way it's uh, kind of current. It's uh, he's the last man on earth, basically. You know, and there are these, I'm not going to say zombies, but these creatures that have survived the pandemic. Um, and so, so the challenge for all of us was to keep civilians out of our shots. You know, that was a real challenge. And we did things that have never been done and never will be done again. We actually locked up the George Washington Bridge. I don't know if you know what that is, but um, where we prevented traffic going from New York into New Jersey. Um, any cars uh, on a weekend, we did that. And, and it's unheard of that, that you could do that. We we closed down Fifth Avenue between 57th Street and I, I think it was about uh, 51st Street. We closed down Columbus Circle, things that have never been done. We, That's amazing. So the challenge was to keep uh, civilians out, out of the frame, you know. I mean, in those days, that was, I think it was 2006 or 2007. In those days, CGI was pretty expensive. So, you know, if a civilian walked in, it was a big deal. And New Yorkers um, film friendly? I mean, do they take direction well or do they just sit there and barge through, of, I'm on a mission, I've got to go somewhere? Yeah, a, a real New Yorker will just say, you know, screw you, I'm not stopping, you know. And the, yeah. uh, the tourists, you know, they, they want to see uh, they want to see stars. So uh, it's a mixed bag. Anybody who's a real New Yorker doesn't want to be inconvenienced. Yeah. yeah, right. I love this shot. It's like so much, you know, and this is this is one of those images that we talk about all the time is that's the real skill of the still photographer is to get the director's performance um, out of an actor instead of, right. you know, doing a setup. And I'll say it time and time again, right. setup sucks the life out of an image and oh, there is right. so much life going on here. I, I You know, setups, I, I mean... I'm not going to say that I never do them. Sometimes yeah. you have to. Sometimes you might be working on a movie where uh, two main characters are only in one scene and you can't really get what you want. So you got to kind of set that up. But like you, I hate them because nobody's into it. You know, it's a rush job. You know, very rarely is the set cleared for you to do it. And the actors, it just, you know, just doesn't work, you know, yeah. for me. You know, somebody's looking at the photograph might not know the difference, but you and I, we know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can pick it out straight away. And, you know, there is occasions that we do have to do a setup if, if um, you know, if it's just the background or something that you want to be absolutely symmetrical, then, yeah, you'll do it. But, I mean, you don't get portraits like this, man. No, no, absolutely. And, again, is again, this is my thing about headroom. You know, a little bit of a haircut on on his hat, and um, 
Uh, he's great to work. I mean, for still photography, Sly is, uh, he's the best. He's one of the best. He, he knows publicity. He knows what sells. Uh, he has no eye line, so he doesn't give a shit, you know. And he kind of knows when you're shooting him, you know, he'll, he'll, give, you, he'll give you what you need. Well, he's a producer too, so he knows that how important stills are. So you know that that does make a difference. And yeah, I'm I'm really now I'll always look at your images and look for the haircut because it really does bring something to the table. It it stops you from looking behind them and really draws the eyes and and the the facial structure towards the image. It's really quite astounding. That's the other thing I was I wanted to say is that. I, I've been mentoring a lot of st young, younger still photographers through uh, Local 600 as a mentorship program. So um, what I find, and I can see it, when I look, and I'm looking at hundreds of photographs that these uh, members have taken, a lot of times it, mostly three quarters are off to the side a little bit, and sometimes that's where you gotta be. But I, I will say to them, are you scared? Are you afraid? Are you scared? And they go, yeah. And I'm like, you gotta go for it. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta go for it. And the way I approach a movie is day one, I'm invisible. You know, day two, that's when I find out what I can do. You know, and I'm, I'm in your face, but I'm not annoying. You know, I'm invisible, but I'm, I'm, I'm there. And that's when you find out what, you know, what your parameters are with the actors. Things have changed a lot with, uh, with cast. I think, I think social media has um, has in some ways made it a little bit easier for us guys um, with what's ex with with cast with what they feel is expected from them. I think. Yeah, I, I, every actor is different. My well, my experience is that British actors are great because they do a lot of theater, so they you know they, they don't really give a crap if you're there and they're online or whatever, and that um, a lot of I'm not going to say a lot of American actors, but American actors more so than British actors have an eye line thing. Um, yeah, it, it all depends. You know, what, what I also find is when an actor's flubbing a lot of lines, I get out. I, yep. I, I get out because I'm, you, you know, you're the one they're going to look at, you know, and you're the one they're going to focus on. They're going to tell you to get out. So I get out before they tell me to get out. What's well, a respect thing too, you know? I mean, like if there's a lot of lines, it's usually not something that we need a lot of. I mean, I'll do a take or two and then get out right. exactly for that reason. I mean, why be an unnecessary distraction when you don't actually need it? You just, you know, no one knows whether you're there or not. And producers at the end of the day actually prefer that you are not a hindrance to their set and their day and still get your images. That's really this is a great shot. Thank, thank you. That's actually going back to that point. You know, if a director's doing eight takes, you know, like you, you know, if it's a dialogue scene, it's just one or two actors. You know, after the second or third take, I'm out of there anyway. Because you know, how many, how much can you shoot? You know what I mean? If you don't have it by then, you know, you're never gonna have it. So, um, you know, there are still photographers who are shooting, you know, like 10,000 images a week, handing in 10,000 images a week, which is insane. Man. But, well, that might be me. <laughs> no, it's not me. <laughs> no, with, with, well, with action, I do not delete much um, yeah. because there's, I've seen posters of mine which have been five, six, seven different elements, you know, an arm from, one one image a leg you know if something if i have an element that's that's beautiful in an action image i'll keep it there um so that so that they can build on it but yeah when it comes to dialogue i'm just i'm, I'm with you it's in if i can get out i get out and i go and edit and get my get my edits done instead of hanging around all day that's what i do I, I, my process is that in the mornings um i, I take the crew call and I go onto the camera truck and I edit the previous day's work. So for the first hour, hour and a half, that's what I'm doing. You know, because it takes them an hour, an hour and a half to set up anyway. Yeah. Um, so I, I, that's how I, I try to learn. But, um, this is from Creed. And um, so this is kind of interesting because um, I actually always wanted to be a sports photographer and dabbled a little bit in it, but couldn't make any money. 
So here was Creed, you know, the opportunity to shoot Creed. And boxing uh, is a really hard sport to, to photograph um, because it's all about when you press that shutter. You know, it's, I'm, I, was, I think I was shooting these at 400th of a second. Um, so in a movie, nobody's really getting hit, although occasionally, occasionally Michael would get hit. So how do you make it look? How do you make it look like people are getting hit? And that's the hard part. So, you know, here's a shot. It's before the hit, but it looks real. And it is real. Yeah, it was hard. Boxing's hard, man. It was hard to photograph, but it was such a joy. I loved working on this movie. Oh, it would have been so much fun. And um, and these two guys, oh, my gosh. How much did they put into the into the work to just be supreme athletes and actors as well? You know, it's incredible. Yes, I actually, I, I, I didn't give you the photograph, but I have a photograph when they finally were done with the last boxing scene, the two of them are just hugging on the floor and just totally fucking drained and, and exhausted, man. Oh, I want to see that, man. You got to show me. That could be in five photo folio as well. <laughs> this was uh, a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. So this is, a, uh, you know, in New York, you, you get to do a lot of romantic comedies, which I think are the hardest things to shoot. I think it's absolutely the hardest, hardest type of movie to shoot because there's not a lot going on, you know? So there's always the kiss. That's, you know, that's the money shot in a romantic comedy. And here it is. So that's J-Lo and uh, Milo. Yeah. And not only that, but pulling off a good kiss is really hard. I mean, so many, so often it's like they're masking each other and, you know, it's right. not easy getting a good angle. and um, that's actually really cool. Yeah, you so got to get it right before they kiss. Because when yeah, right. you're actually kissing, it doesn't work. So you got to get yeah, it right. Swished in, <laughs> swished in faces. <laughs> uh, okay, amazing. so this is from the movie Unfaithful. Um, and that's Richard oh. Gere and Diane Lane. And uh, Adrian Lyon, who I'd worked with on Nine and a Half Weeks, uh, directed this. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't say this beforehand, but... You know, we owe so much to the uh, cinematographers that we work with because they make us shine or they make us not shine. You know, I mean, we could compose a great shot, but they can make it shine if the light is beautiful. You know? So uh, the DP on this uh, film was a guy named uh, Peter Bijou, and he was really a great DP. So um, for me, this shot is all about passion. You know, it's, yeah. Really about. I don't know if you saw the movie, but it's at the end when they're sort of reconciling, and um, um, yeah, it's touching. That shot. And actually, the thing about Unfaithful was there was so much sex, and as you know, usually we're asked not to be there. Yeah, it's a closed set. Um, so I, I, there was a lot of sex scenes, and it was the last one that was going to happen. And I went up to Diane. And I said uh, she wasn't going to be naked or anything, but I said, Diane. Um, I haven't been able to get anything, you know, any kind of essential shots. Are you okay from there for the scene? And she said, sure. And that ended up, that shot ended up being the poster. It's and a beautiful thing. image. Oh, it's so powerful. It wasn't this, wasn't this shot that was the uh, poster. It was another shot. Um, but, you know, that's another story where, where the one sheet was used from the unit art. And had I not gone up to her and asked her if I could be there, you know, um, if I had not had a relationship with her, uh, she probably would have said no. You know, she trusted. Well, she trust yeah, she tr there you go. She trusted you, and that's um, I think that's key to to our to what we do is our behaviour on set and and um, getting the trust of those around us to get this. I mean, I could look at this image for days. Well, team, that was episode one with Barry Wetcher. Ah, gee, I tell you. No wonder I look up to him so much. Great stories there from I Am Legend and Creed and just his insight into photography and, and how crew work on set and relationship with cast. And I mean, I'm blown away. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. We've got episode two coming up. So please subscribe and do the bell so you get notified and uh, have a great day. Cheers.